are boys cleverer than girls? Yeah. Men will walk into a managing director's office and say, I deserve a pay rise. Most women don't. Women are selected based on what they've done, whereas men are, you know, selected based on who they can become. This is what kills me. We are losing great people. I have for many, many years thought I was the problem. Welcome to the She Word Women in Business Edition. Conversations that women rarely have, but really should. I am your host, Helen Chorley, investment banker turned angel investor, and this is the all new Women in Business series where we're going to shine a light on those conversations that women should be having in the workplace. Today's topic is the gender pay gap. But before we get into that, if you are an existing She Word fan, thank you. Thank you for watching, following, sharing the episodes. And if you're new here, welcome. If you don't want to miss a future episode, please follow, like, subscribe across all our channels, Spotify, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, LinkedIn, and of course, YouTube. And if you are a Patreon subscriber, a huge thank you to you. You are seeing this episode before anybody else. And by being a Patreon subscriber, you are making a difference in the lives of women who need guidance, support, and therapy through our partnership with the Richmond Foundation. Another reason to follow all our channels is that we are bringing you an amazing event. On the 24th and 25th of May, we are going to be hosting the She Word Live conference at the MCC in Valletta. In these two amazing days, we are bringing you international speakers from across the globe, inspirational women and outstanding women on panel events where you can interact with live Q&As. So the tickets are now live. So go and grab yours because if you want a good seat, honestly, get it today. What an episode we have today to kick off this series, The Gender Pay Gap. It seems unreal that we're still discussing gender pay gaps and imbalanced gender ratios in organizations. Most will acknowledge the challenge, speak about it, yet never really commit to long-term change. It's time to start spreading awareness to an issue that has been on the agenda for too long. How serious are we about bridging the gender pay gap? How real is it in our organizations? And if so, are we ready to take action to ensure women are being paid equally? Luckily today, there are tools that can provide us with that data, which can revolutionize how we address these issues. It's time to take back our strategies with hardcore numbers, think very dear to my heart, and make real change happen. And we have three incredible guests who know all about this issue firsthand. Let me introduce you to them. Yasmin, welcome. Thank you. So Yasmin, you are, you describe yourself as an entrepreneur at heart who views people as the most important re resource that a company can have. And you wear two very different hats. You're founder and MD of Sanya Eco Spa in the Shah, and you're also the uh, CEO of Shaburn Software, which your father originally founded and you took over four years ago. And it's really how this episode came about, right? But we'll, we'll get onto that. First, let me come to Michaela Fennec Patch. Welcome. Thank you. You describe yourself as a hands on HR professional. You're a coach, an author, public speaker, specializing in HR organizational transformation, executive coaching, team coaching, and you're a mother of five. Minor detail. <laughs> <laughs> and we're also joined by Adrian McCarthy of KPMG. Adrian leads KPMG Islands Group People Team. 
She has an MSc in organizational psychology and over 20 years global HR experience. And as you'll hear from her beautiful accent, it's from Ireland originally. So welcome, ladies. I've introduced you, but please take a moment to add any details, share your story and reasons for why this issue matters so much to you personally. Yasmin. You want me to kick off? <laughs> Great. Well, I think for me personally, more than the gender pay gap, what really interests me is the participation rate of women in leadership positions. And I think obviously being a woman, I can relate more to the feeling and I've had my own stories in my career of feeling like I was being treated differently based on being a woman. Thankfully, they weren't um, as common as many other women face, but I still have firsthand experience of that. But it also makes me think of all the other people who are excluded from leadership as well, who maybe I don't have personal experience of, right? Ethnic minorities, for example, or, or anyone who just doesn't have access to leadership. And I think for me, what I'm so excited about this discussion is because Having women in leadership positions gives such amazing outcomes. So I'm looking forward to hearing, okay, why are we in this situation? What do the numbers tell us and how do we make the change? Thank you. Michaela. So I, I guess I see the conversation from a little bit of a different perspective. Next year, I will be 13, turning 50. So this is a really great time to be able to look back and say, did I miss out on leadership positions? And it's funny because when I look back, I never quite made it to the C-suite. And I don't think it's because I was necessarily not competent enough to make it to the C-suite, but because of circumstance and also possibly because I was a woman and the way I presented myself as a woman. So of course I've done a lot of work in the area of the way I present myself, the way I impact. But then I look back and I say, have I overthought the way I impact, the way I bring myself into a boardroom and have blamed myself for a lot, wow. so not reaching those positions. Mm. And I found myself leading the conversation and actually thinking how many women in their 40s actually want to join C-suite in this country? Because by that time, especially women who have kids, we're raising teenagers. And all of a sudden you've, you've gotten to that position where you're thinking, is this all it is? It's too much stress, I've worked too hard to get here and it's really not as big as it's shaken up to be. My voice is not as loud as it should be. And therefore, so, so this, is where I, this is where I'm standing at the moment. So it's going to be a really interesting discussion to, to banter with, 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 with all, all of you to be able to understand, are we, do we want to be part of the C-suite? And if we want to be part of the C-suite, on what terms? And do we have a right to set those terms? Really, really, really great question. We'll definitely get onto that. And Adrian? I, I think probably what motivates me a lot is that I've got two daughters of my own. And, um, you know, I reflect on the type of world. One's a 10-year-old, the other's a two-year-old. And I kind of reflect on the type of world, you know, is, is going to be there for them when they enter the workplace. And, you know, what role I can play in, in making sure that that's the best possible, most equitable, you know, world for them, where they'll be, I suppose, measured, promoted, given a salary based very much so on, on, on their merit and their performance as, as opposed to, you know, their, their gender. So for me, that, that really drives me. I think I probably having worked with maybe a global organization where, you know, we're very much so in tune with, with the, the, the female diversity um, agenda, I personally, I haven't experienced it. I've worked in Malta, you know, in, in, for the last nine years. And I, I've never felt that it's held me back in any way um, in terms of my own career. So then when I hear others, you know, relate and females talking about it, you know, I kind of say, well, actually, you know what? It can be something else. It's possible to make it something else. And there for me, that's the optimism yeah. and where I see we can really make a difference. Yeah. You know, so I, I always think it begins from within and, you know, what can I do to make a difference? So we hear people talk about it and it's this way and, 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 and kind of complain. But yet, you know, how often do we see people take it to the next step, you know, and say, actually, I'm going to challenge it. Exactly. You know, but it why doesn't, is it this it, way? Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have to be. Yeah. And that's exactly what this show is about, yeah. showing the possibilities, planting those seeds, opening up yeah. the conversation. Yeah. So this whole episode came about because of a voice note that Yasmin left for me, sharing with me some data that Shireburn had been working on and I have to say, sent it straight to Trudy, 
And I was literally, boom, it blew my mind. Normally, at this part of the episode, we would share some stats, but Yasmin, because this is your data, I'm going to hand over you, hand over to you to share the numbers that you had because some of them were really shocking and some of them broke my heart a tiny little bit, I have to admit. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what I shared with you, um, Helen, was just some two or three really key statistics. And the interesting thing for me, right, is when I saw the data myself, um, and for those who don't know, right, so Shireburn is a payroll and HR solution provider. So we aggregate a lot of data. Um, and we've been on this journey last year to give companies this data to empower them to see where they need to tweak, right? HR analytics is something quite new, certainly to certain organizations. And we wanted to empower them to be able to look at this data and say, okay, you know, I've got a high turnover here, or I've got X over there. How can I be better as a company? Um, but as it was coming up to Women's Day, I said, oh, I'm I'm curious to look at the aggregated and obviously anonymized um, versions of this data and have a look at what, what the data is saying about women. And two things, now in hindsight, it's more shocking that I was so shocked because as I've done research, actually this data is kind of the same all around the world. Wow. And uh, Adrienne shared a report um, that McKinsey um, released not so long ago and the data was the same. And it's two things. So we know that there's a, a salary gap. We know that um, on average... Um, women are paid around 11 to 12 percent less um, in Europe on the whole, if I'm not mistaken, but definitely in Malta, right? It's about 11, 12 percent. Um, and that was the same in our data. What shocked me more was that when I was discussing with the team, the data, one of um, our teams said, oh, by the way, this data excludes c suite they don't generally look at C-suite when they're looking at the gender pay gap. But I thought, oh, that's interesting. Mm. And I said, well, I'd love to see the data for the C-suite. And we just had a look. And the participation rate of women at sea level in Malta is only 10%. And that shocked me. Which, again, is strange, right? Because actually, we've kind of seen this around the world that until attention is put to it, participation rates of women and any minority are between seven to 10%. Wow. So without attention, any minority is gonna have a less than 10% representation level. But it's interesting that I just wasn't aware about it. Yeah. Um, the good news is that studies have shown that when attention is put to it, the data does change, right? So in the UK, they're up to 48% representation for non-executive directors for women. Right. And, and that was, they took that, actually, I think it was in about, uh, I'm not sure if it was three years or seven years, but it went from 7% to 48%. So the good news is that real change can happen when not only do we look at the data, right, because the data on the gender pay gap and participation rates, I feel, has been there for a number of years. But I think sometimes some people just take leadership. Um, and Rene said to me yesterday, you know, data doesn't make change. Leaders create change. So my agenda today, right, and, and in everything that I do at work is, okay, how do we get a more diverse and more inclusive leadership? Primarily to women, but then we need to extend that even beyond women. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. And Michaela, which of the, which of the stats, which of the data shocked you the most? I'm not sure I would say I was shocked. Mm -hmm. In all honesty, I don't, think, I don't think I was shocked because I've worked in this country for a number of years and I've worked with organizations. So I don't think the data really, really shocked me. Um, I wouldn't say it amused me because it, it's not something amusing, but you know, sometimes if you don't have a sense of humor in Malta, it, it, it kind of becomes quite depressing. So, um, but possibly one, one area that... I was like, ooh, was education, for example, you know, like about, I think, 78% of women work in education and still there's a gender pay gap in education. And so my question is, we possibly need to change the discourse. Where are we the problem? Are women the problem? Mm -hmm. uh, do, do we need to start from ourselves? And, and, and this is what, you know, when, you, when, you, when I started to become a coach and my work, a lot of my work with Yasmin has been taking responsibility. And that's the first thing you do is you take responsibility. And the issue of gender pay gap exists. It's very real. It's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking. 
but how much responsibility lies on us as women? We need to look in that mirror, look back at ourselves and see. So we need to, we need to ask ourselves these really hard issues rather than blame everyone. You know, I always used to say when I worked at the foreign ministry, when I worked in, in private sector, we all have a weep story. Everyone has a weep story. Someone's been passed over for promotion. That boss was really nasty, you know, very toxic environment, etc. We all have a weep story. But if you look back, generally, one can identify a bit of a pattern. So I can identify very strong patterns with myself in the workplace from one workplace to another. A lot has to do with our scripts. A lot has to do with our backgrounds. A lot has to do with our culture. It would be interesting to hear from Adrienne as to coming from a different culture, yeah. nonetheless a Catholic culture and also an island state, also a, a, a smaller, but maybe a bit larger than us to see what her impressions are of the Maltese workplace. But what can we do? How can we change our script? How can we change our destiny as women? You know, are we, can we walk into a, an interview and ask for a salary that we want and we deserve. So Adrienne and I had breakfast a few weeks ago and we were, I was about to go to a client and I said, I think I'm, I'm charging really little. And she said, you know, you really should charge more for your services. Like any man would be charging probably three, four times more than you. And it was a real struggle. A really big struggle. Yeah. I you think know, even yeah. to get my head around it. Yeah, that's a really, really common thing. And what you're saying, actually, is that in education, where it, there's much more, there's the higher participation rate, so there's more women in education than, than men, that still that gender pay gap exists, which is... It is which probably means that, that, that the men in education are probably occupying the higher roles yes. also. Because education is one area in Malta which is, is, is very highly regulated in terms of salaries. So you have salary bands, which are pegged to government salary bands. So, so my question is... To be fair, this data is probably private school data. Yes. Right? The data no, that but you still, still to. private school data is actually linked to, to, to salary, salary bands of government most, mostly. So it's, it's, it's very interesting to understand that men in education are much smaller percentage-wise, but are women not taking leadership roles? Are we not taking them or are we not being given them? And Adrian, is, is there a particular, you know, you talked about the McKinsey study. Is there a particular part of that that really struck or resonated with you? Yeah, I, I think probably there were two pieces that came out for me. One was around, um, you know, so if we look at talent strategies, which are very much so, you know, it's, it's around the hiring, you know, decisions around promotion, decisions around reward, salary, and, and, and decisions around development. You know, when you look at those decisions and we look at men versus women, and there's a lot of research around this. It's interesting that, you know, women are selected and decisions are made based on what they've done, um, whereas men are, you know, selected based on who they can become. And so that's potential. The potential, whereas women, it's very much so about what, what they've done. So it's like a performance bias Ooh. that's built into the talent strategy decisions that, that are made in, in organizations. Now, this, this isn't just me saying that this is, uh, <laughs> it's, um, you know, kind of inherent in the system and, and, and the research um, shows it. So I think, you know, it's important when we look, and again, I'm looking at it with an organizational lens is, you know, when we're making decisions around our talent, which in most organizations now we say our biggest asset is our people, you know, when, when we make decisions around that, you know, what, what kind of decisions are we making? Is there some sort of bias inherent in it? And this is what, you know, Shireburn, when they come into their own and, and they're able to provide the data. And, and I mean, you're very much so data driven, you know, in, in terms of how, how you look at scenarios. So I think by having the, you know, the analytics to see the decisions that we make when it comes to hiring, when it comes to promotions, when it comes to salary increases, when it comes to, you know, developing people, you know, what's the gender balance like when, when we're doing that? And by looking at that, I think that in itself, it'll, it'll tell its own story. Um, but, you know, you say as well, you can only, you know, you, you can only, what is it? You can only, what you can measure, you, you, you can change. So if we don't measure it, we can't change it. So the great thing about all of this and International Women's Day and everything is that it obviously, it forces us, and we shouldn't have to be forced, but it does force us to look at, you know, the headline is, okay, we all get it. There, there's less men or there's less women than men in, in, in C-suite. But only by looking then at the actual data and analyzing it, we get to understand because there's always a story behind the, the, the data that, um, that drives us. So for me, that was one thing that really stood out, this performance bias. And why is it that women, you know, we just look at their past and, you know, and if 
really hits women, I think, at a manager level, you know, that, that kind of first, because if you're just looking at, at a woman based on what they've done in the past, for a woman who's going into their first step in, in management, I mean, they've a short history, a short work span of, of, of what they've done, versus if I'm to look at a man and I think about his potential, you know, I'm looking at something completely different. So, you know, obviously there's kind of almost uh, an unfair maybe advantage, you know, when it comes to, to, to how we look at that. I think that's uh, the, the second big piece and it's connected is, is um, looking at, and again, it goes back to looking at the, probably looking at the data. So if I was to look at it technically as a HR person, I would look at the gender proportionality, um, you know, uh, the, the, the practice behind it. So really what I'm saying is that if I look at the proportionality of males to females at any level in an organization, um, I would expect that the level below that represents the level that I'm looking at. Okay. So if I'm seeing a C-suite with 10% females, I expect the consistency to be same at the next level down. So I would expect the directors, there only to be 10%. I would expect then the managers, there only being 10%. And then I'd expect, you know, right down to team member that there's only 10%. Now, somewhere along that, yeah. we're not going to see that, obviously, because, you know, the, the, why we're here today and what we're talking about. So where we see that maybe is more at the senior manager level. We start to see, you know, it goes from 10% to maybe 20% to maybe 30% to 50%. Now, why has it gone from 50% to 30%? Yeah. And that's what, you know, we really need to focus on. So what is it at that 30% level? Be it in, in you know, uh, I give you an example, a senior manager level versus an executive C-suite level. So what is it or why has that broken rung in a ladder is what I would call it. So I think we need to see, you know, where, 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 where that broken rung is. And then we need to look at why that's there. Why does it exist? And again, you kind of need to go into the data to really understand and actually get out there and talk to people to really understand why there is that broken rung at that particular level. Because until I fix that broken rung, no female, it's going to be very, very difficult to jump up past it. It's um, a really good analogy, isn't it, mm -hmm. of thinking about that? Because literally you, you can see it, you can see the steps and at mm. some point... That step is that, missing. Yeah. 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 No, wow. Why? Yeah. Why and, and, mm. and how do we fix it? And actually, Yasmin, you speak a lot about, and, and it's a really kind of interesting question, is it the people or is it the environment or is it, or is it both? What are your thoughts on that? I have to say that coming from the self-development world, I always had this perspective of we have to change ourselves, as, as Michaela was saying, and there is definitely an element of truth, right? I think it's good for us women to know that one of the things that shocked me from the report was that women score higher than men in all um, attributes of leadership. I thought, wow, okay, I didn't know that. Right? It's good that we know this. We know where maybe we struggle to ask for more or whatever it may be. There are some challenges that we face. Um, and let's do our best to sort of rise to meet that challenge. But I think if we only focused on that, I don't think we'd really see large scale change. Uh -huh. I think it's also the environment. Yeah. And what Adrienne shared about the, the broken rung makes a lot of sense to me. And of course, the McKinsey study showed that the first challenge where we're losing most women is that initial transition into mm. leadership. And of course, you explained it perfectly. If we're mm. judging someone on what they've done and they've never led, then we'll say, okay, you can't lead. Whereas if I'm looking at a man, I'll say he hasn't led, but I can see he's got it. I can it, see so the potential. I can see <laughs> so I'm going to give him that try. So of course, we're the environment. Mm. Yeah, and I have to say, we're, we're transitioning out of decades of a script of what a leader is. Yeah. Leader leads from the front, he's dominating, he's the alpha, he, he, he. That has been our history. Yeah. And now we're starting to realize that actually collaborative leadership is so much more powerful and women are great collaborators, right? This is sometimes why we earn less because we think of others more, yeah. we're more agreeable. Yeah. These are actually great leadership traits. Yeah. So how do we, as a CEO, and I have to say that I don't think I do this well enough. And I'm a leader. I'm a woman. I believe in women. I want women leaders. But I don't think that I've put enough attention to my rung. And after reading that study and all of the discussions we've had um, this week around Women's Week, I'm going to go and look at my rung. And what that tells me is that there are probably a lot of other leaders, men and women, who believe in women, yeah. want women leaders, probably even many men who consider themselves feminists, and they yeah. just 
haven't realized that they have a problem in their rung. So then when they're coming to take a C-suite decision, they look at the pool that they have to choose from and the women have already fe fallen down by the wayside. So I think for me, it's a question of attention and leaders need to step up yeah. and ask ourselves if we want to create an inclusive leadership culture, if we want to create the most productive leadership culture, then we have to look at those people that we're leaving behind. And, and I would extend that beyond women as well to young people, people of different um, gender identities, uh, different races, different religions. There's almost an element of actually good leadership these days is, is mending that rung. It's bringing those people that are kind of behind you or lower than you in rank terms, but bringing them with you repairing that rung and then you all move up together it's that collaboration that that you talked about i think more than i think if i can jump in here i think more than good leadership if i can correct you it's good business sense yes so uh, it makes business sense to have women around the table and not just because they're women but because they bring something different yes. just like it makes business sense to bring people in from different cultures and from different religions from different backgrounds because diversity creates tension and tension creates better results. I remember, so I was very heavily involved in the Libya crisis in 2011, I worked in government. And I remember um, Prime Minister Gonzi at the time, his greatest asset was Foreign Minister Tony Aborc because he had an opposing view. Mm -hmm. And so he was great and he, it was fantastic for the prime minister because he made better decisions as a result of that opposing view. From being challenged. From being challenged because you do. And leaders are very, leadership is a very lonely place. So the more diversity you have around the table, the better your decisions are going to be, the better your business is going to be, the more chances of success. And not only that, but I don't think business leaders today have a choice because, you know, my generation possibly are blinded to the issues of and the challenges of women in the workplace because we grew up in it. And when you yeah. grow up in it, this is like when you've passed down a road and you've seen it a million times, you kind of forget what it looks like. And so in a sense, when you grow up in, in, in something, you take everything as, as a given mm -hmm. and you accept it. Whereas the younger generation are not like us. Yeah. First of all, in Malta, there was a massive shift. We have mixed schools today. We grew up in single-sex schools, and today we have mixed schools. And so sex and the difference in gender doesn't mean what it meant in my days. Yeah, different paradigm. So the, the, the paradigm shift, and for businesses to be able to get and retain the best talent of the younger generation, they have to change. Yeah. So change is actually going to be necessitated by the drive for good talent. It's really interesting that you say kind of how much that influence of, of how you grow up and the paradigm that you grow up in, because something Trudy speaks about a lot is that when we grow up, because we're both of a certain age, 50 next year too, uh, that the two most powerful women in the UK were both, uh, the two most powerful leaders in the UK were women. We had the Queen and we had Thatcher. So it's a very different paradigm from Malta of, of that time, for example. Yeah, but look at, uh, so the Queen inherited... And look at what they say about Thatcher. <laughs> a, a polarizing personality. <laughs> so she, yeah. I'm Do from the north I mean, of England, so <laughs> she ain't very popular up there. Not, not but. at all. But what I'm saying is this, is that it is very much how you bring up. And so we've had this discussion time and time again. What are the benefits of women around the boardroom table? What yeah. are the benefits? I don't think we talk about the benefits enough. Yeah. I don't think we talk about the stories enough. If I can add something as well, because, you know, Michaela said it, it's good business sense. Um, the problem, I think, where the leadership comes in is, as she said, good leadership creates an environment where you can get challenged. But initially, that's not easy as a leader. Why would I choose to have a senior leadership team who are all going to disagree with me as opposed to <laughs> those who are all going to agree with me, yeah, right? It's yes, going to take more yeah, time yeah. and it's going to make my life hard. And that's where the leadership comes in to say, OK, maybe it's going to take longer to get there. But eventually we're going to get to a better decision because we have women around the table. And again, I think this is really important because unfortunately a line that I hear from men a lot is don't be too much of a feminist. And, but if I would ask them, are you a feminist? They would probably say yes. 
right? So there is something in the way we talk about this data yeah. that makes people feel very uncomfortable or scared, or maybe it's because they don't want the data to be that, right? They consider themselves as people who want women around the table. And, and this is where I think the attention piece comes in. Because if even I, as a woman, sometimes don't put attention to this, then mm. of course someone who is a, is a man and hasn't had that kind of experience of exclusion just wouldn't yeah. come as naturally. Myself and Michaela were organizing a conference that we had a couple of days ago and we went to the speakers, we were trying to curate our agenda and we met with one of the speakers, Andrew, and we sat down, we were talk telling him about the conference and um, he asked us, okay, who are the other speakers going to be? We we're giving him a bit of an idea and he just looked at us and said, there aren't enough women. And he really like, oh, I just felt it, you know, like yeah. me, me not choosing enough women. I'm always there saying there aren't enough women on these yeah. conferences. Me, my conference, and I just didn't notice that I hadn't paid specific attention to there being enough women. And I really, really thank Andrew. And, yeah. and, and Andrew's the kind of person who is very sensitive, right, to exclusion in general. He's had his own experiences, which he's shared publicly as well. So he has that sensitivity yeah. to, hey, we need to be inclusive. And I think this is a message that we do really need to share that, hey, even though it might not be my personal experience, like how do we feel into those people that might not put themselves forward to leadership, right? Yeah. Those people who are, yes, they're looking at the past experience and, oh, I haven't done enough yet to be a leader. And sometimes women, I, I think, or certainly from what I've seen with my community. So I'm the co-founder of a um, Property Sisters UK, which is a community for female SME, female developers. And I'm always kind of encouraging them because I'm also a judge for national awards in the UK in property and construction, pushing them forward to like apply for this, apply for this, put yourself forward. And sometimes we're not so great at pushing ourselves forward for asking for that pay rise, for, for you know, going for that visibility. Has that been your experience, Adrian? Um, it's it's interesting because I, I I said when I was asked when Yasmin asked me and uh, Michaela would I do this I said well let me start at home you know and let me ask the question to my ten year old daughter and then let me ask the question to my partner mm. so the ten year old daughter you know kind of says well you know because women join the workforce later in Malta you know so she's really reflecting on you know, the role of women in society in Malta, you know, and, and, and that kind of perceived that, you know, the kind of the, the role of primary caregiver is, yes. is, is the woman. She's kind of reflecting on that. And we yeah. joined the workforce later, so we have a bit of catching up to do. It's the 10-year-old's version of it. <laughs> and my partner's version is very much so, well, women are too honest. You know, they, they kind of, uh, they do the right thing. You know, they say, they say exactly what their experience is. They play it down. And, you know, um, men do the opposite, that they're well able to. So it's the negotiation, I think, piece of it as, as, as well. So they're maybe better able to, I don't say they're better able to negotiate it, but it probably comes with confidence as well. And I think it's connected to, we hear a lot about the imposter syndrome in, uh, in, in females. And it's like we play ourselves down, yeah. I think, uh, more than we should. Uh, you know, and I think it, it really, it does come from within. And I think it has to start with every female, you know, when they're in these situations that they're willing to, you know, call it as it is or, or, or speak about how they feel. And what I do notice is when they do that, you know, you know, generally the systems are there and, and people have, you know, the right intent yeah. uh, and they want to do what's right. But unless you become aware, or, you know, you bring that awareness to the table, um, it, it, it doesn't uh, get addressed. Yeah. And imposter syndrome is so prevalent. That is not just limited to one sector, one level. It, it's right. Gender. It, mm. Absolutely everywhere. I was having this discussion actually with a PT even, um, you know, and she really resonated with that. In fact, one of our episodes is going to be on imposter syndrome. So I oh. can't wait <laughs> to it, have so. that discussion. I really can't. But we kind of touched on, we've got the data. So there's, there's things we can use to implement change. But it's something you said, Michaela, do we know, are we clear, do we communicate it well enough what the benefits of having more participation, more women at the table, particularly at C-suite, do we know what those are? No. Right. I think simply no. Mm -hmm. Also, and I don't, I don't blame male leaders, in all honesty, for this situation because there aren't enough women around the table. Yeah. And when they are, how are we, are we giving them enough space? 
because we function in a very different way. So if you ask women to go to a meeting, they'll ask for the agenda. They'll read every paper. So true. They'll so make true. sure they're over-prepared. And every single woman I have coached has the exact same issue. They hate it. They walk into a meeting. There are probably maybe one or two women around the table. They're hugely prepared. They've read every line. They know everything about what's going on. And the men wing it. They wing it. And you're there frustrated because you know the stuff being discussed is not necessarily relevant to the point on the agenda and you somehow can't get in. Yeah. How do you get into that conversation? But why do women put themselves in this scenario? They're there, they have the information. Why do they not go into that room and say, you know, I've done the research, I, you know, I've, I've, I've got the answer, so to speak. So why do we hold back as, as females? And it goes back to my point, even around the pay, you know, um, Gap, you asked as well, why don't we ask? You know, what is it? Why do we hold ourselves back? It's a very good question. And I've been in that situation many times. I mean, I'm not one to not speak up. Yeah, right. For sure. So what, what was... No, no, I'm not of, one yeah. to not speak up. And so this is why, in fact, at the beginning, I turned to Yaz and I said, I have heartburn before this conversation because it is a really difficult conversation for me to have because I have for many, many years thought I was the problem. For many, many years around the C-suite, mm -hmm. I thought I was the problem, you know. So you, you're there, but you're not quite there. You're always a B plus. Mm -hmm. you know, it's very annoying to be a B plus because you're not just not an A yet. You're not good enough. Ooh. You're not good enough, you know. And m many women around the C-suite, I find, are very silent, very compliant. Yeah. So it, I am I'm a very different breed, you know. I have a very strong opinion. Yes, it's true. It comes with an agenda. We all have agendas. You know, you're pushing your agenda. Every man is pushing their agenda around the boardroom table and any table for that matter. But it comes across very differently. Somehow it lands. And I've been acutely aware recently of, so the impact I have when I walk into a room, the impact I have around the table, mm -hmm. the impact on other people, the impact especially on men. And we've discussed this to death. So Yaz will probably be able to give you more insight because this is, of course, this is a journey. So you want to be the most impactful. On the one hand, you're like, you know what? Sod it. Just take it, take me as I am. Yeah. But on the other, you say, I need to be impactful. How am I going to be best impactful? Yeah. How do I get my message across? Because I've read the mm. data. I know the data. Recently, a female leader told me, so one, one of the female leaders I coach, um, she said, you know, I read the stuff and the conversation around the table was the complete opposite. And I thought to myself, but all these experts, all these lawyers, all these men around the table, surely they're cleverer than me. Surely the stuff I read was not what I read. So I kept my mouth shut. Wow. And she was right, by the way. She could have spared the business quite a bit. Wow. Had she spoken up. No. And so I don't know where the self-doubt comes from. Mm. Is it even a societal thing? Like something you said there really resonates with me. And it's a story from when I was about, well, actually, it's a story from my first few weeks at primary school when you said she assumed that the guys around the table were cleverer than her. My mum loves this story and loves to torment me with this story that I came home from school two weeks in, age four or five, and I said to my mum, Mummy, why are boys cleverer than girls? <laughs> she, can you imagine? This is the woman who had been programmed me from birth that I was going to go to university and go on and do, do you know, proper, you know, true feminist, um, maybe too extreme feminist. And so she absolutely hit the roof. But that was the, you know, I obviously had no judgment around that. I just took it as fat because that's what I was hearing. That's what the boys were telling me. But I wouldn't have just taken it on one little boy in the playground. I must have been getting that information from somewhere, from somewhere else. So we had a whole lesson in why that wasn't factually correct. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we value female traits enough mm. in business. And the story of business <laughs> has been quite a male leaning story it kind of plays to male traits yeah. um i think erroneously because i think going back to that study and mm. women have so many incredible leadership traits 
But if you don't see that and you're not modeled that, you won't realize it. You'd think, oh, it's the more masculine traits that are being more valued around the table. And you just keep those insights or those values that you just feel there isn't a safety, there isn't a safe space around the table where that that is being valued. And obviously, if something's not valued, you're going to keep on giving your opinion and it's not being valued. Eventually, you're just going to give up and get tired. So it's. I think it's sad that people with very good opinions and very valuable insights, who quite often at leadership tend to be female, are not really made to feel safe um, to give those opinions. And, and perhaps leaders in general, we're not coaching our leaders, yeah. men and women included, how do we create a safe space for inclusivity of all different kinds of leadership traits that might just not be the norm, might not be the norm of the past decades where the Jack Welsh was like the, mm. <laughs> you know, the, the idea of what an entrepreneur should be. I think those ideas are so old. They're yeah. so outdated. Yeah. The new stories, yesterday I was actually searching for inspirational stories of female CEOs and I didn't know any of them. Whoa. Actually, they, they weren't me. names that I know. If you Googled mm. what are the 10 most inspirational, you'd, you'd hear the, you'd the Zuckerberg and Elon and mm. you, you knew them. We know Jack Welsh was probably like 10 years old when he retired, but I still know his name and I know his style. Mm. But if I had to tell you like who are the top 10 most inspirational women, I think we'd probably struggle to come up with 10 because those stories are just not as prominent. And, and I think when you see yourself modeled, then it gives you the confidence to say, hey, yes, going back to the, the Queen and Thatcher, right? Yes, this is possible for me. I, my traits are valued and therefore I'm going to give them more. Yeah, and, and the visibility, as you say, and again, that goes back to like why I'm pushing people all the time, but go for this award, put yourself out there because it's only by seeing it do you believe that it's possible. Yeah. It's exactly yeah. where, kind of where we mm, started. We but society back. also has to model. I mean, you know, we had this conversation, I think a few days ago, yes, yeah, you know, Malta and gender quotas. And all of a sudden we say, okay, we have gender quotas in parliament. Maybe this is what we need to do. And we already have an overinflated parliament. We have 64 seats for like this tiny population. <laughs> but instead of including the gender quota on 64, we increase the number. Because wow. I mean, you know, it would be a tragedy if some men who were in parliament last time round don't get there because of a gender quota. And then on the other hand, you know, you have a situation of the men saying, oh, you don't really need to vote for the women because they're going to get in anyway with the gender quota. Ooh. So you're you creating know? So in issue. a sense, society has, has, doesn't model it. Mm -hmm. And so this is where our politicians and our society need to model it. We really, really need to model it. And, you know, Parliament meets at six o'clock in the evening. You ask women where they are at six o'clock in the evening. <laughs> every single woman will give you the same answer. So, you know, where are the barriers to leadership? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I agree as women have huge leadership traits. Incredible. We have the capacity to be able to understand, you know, take a mom. The capacity to understand which kid likes what. <laughs> what kind of discipline one responds to the most, yeah. what kind of pull and shove. Mm -hmm. And that is an innate sense that you develop. So that's a, that is an incredible leadership trait. Yeah, all but those nuances. All the nuances that are, that are able to mm -hmm. work. And I mean, I see amazing leaders. I see Adrienne, I see Az, I see Az every day at work and the way people respond. And it's phenomenal. But her way is completely different. Yeah. But interestingly, if you were to write a job description for the leader you know, profile in Shireburn. And if you're to look at the language behind it, that would have been male orientated in how it was written. So we'd use male orientated words like strong. So what I love is when, if I look at leadership and I want to see, you know, really and truly do they, you know, is it ingrained into how they operate? I'll yeah. take a leadership job description and I'll look at the wording and see, is it like male orientated or dominant or is it actually female orientated or dominant so when you talk about the leadership traits yeah you, you probably you know you're talking about the collaboration that women bring to the table and and, and these other you know the kind of i've called them the softer traits and then you think of the male style and it's kind of more strong that word strong and when i see that word strong i immediately <laughs> associate with so there's a natural kind of bias already built into leadership roles a lot of the time because of even how we actually describe that role of a leader when we do a job description on it which then inherently brings in a certain 
profile, our character, which typically tends to be more representative of male than it is of, of, of females. Yeah, or that masculine mm. energy. Even that word, like soft skills, it's, it feels like it's a weak what word, you doesn't it? Yeah, but yeah. it's so important. I have to say, I'm going to just piggyback onto what Michaela said. And sure. as you know, this morning I was interviewing René Carayol, who's coach, you know, some of the top leaders, both men and women across across the world. And I asked him, because he talks a lot about leaning into your strengths. And I yeah. said, okay, who taught you this? Who was your first teacher? And he said to me, you know who the best leaders are? Mothers, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I absolutely love that because it's true. And, and Michaela touched on it, right? The empathy, the knowing intuitively what someone's feeling, mm -hmm. the tailoring your discussion to make sure that they feel included so that you're using your language to make sure that you un they under they're understanding you. These are all incredible leadership qualities yeah. that as a society, mm -hmm. both men and women, we've undervalued these traits. Mm -hmm. And, and <laughs> creating that safe yeah. space. <laughs> I have to say, so, so I mean, this is again, yeah, it, you touch on something that is really, really particular. And I'll tell you why. Because women in Malta grow up idolizing their dads. Mm -hmm. And it's funny. So I turn to my kids really often and I say, why does a mom always get the blame? You know, so if, 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 if there's a murderer, we always turn around and blame the mom. It's really weird. And, and I feel it. I feel it even with my kids. I'm like, no matter what I do, I will always be judged more harshly. And if I look back at my parents, mm. I judged my mom much harder than I judged my dad. So I idolized my dad, but actually I should have idolized my mom or both, but not just the dad. And it's very strange because I have four daughters and I, I very often, I mean, they think I'm a bit weird when I say these things, but, uh, but I, I've really started to analyze. And then of course that then leads you to your relationship with your parents and your relationship with, and, and do we judge our moms and women in our lives? Do we hold them to higher standards? Do we judge them more? Do we expect more? It's the question. I, I don't have the answer. I, I don't know if I agree with that, that, that most women grow up idolizing their dads. I mean, I don't have a theory on it, but when you say it, I don't know if, if, if that's really the case. Well, maybe I'm projecting, maybe it's just me. <laughs> well, that's what it. it makes me think is, is it also the, it's the kind of the reverse truth that boys grow up idolizing their mums. Anyway, that's a whole, <laughs> whole, not, whole other tangent. I mean, I think, I think we'll get in dangerous territory you know, if we make generalizations yeah. or, mm. you know, on psychological kind of patterns. But I think, the generalization of as a society, we undervalue the feminine, mothers yes. included. So yes, but possibly we take the people that love us the most for granted, right? And so our people that we know are always there for us. And in many occasions that is the mother, but sometimes it's the father too. Um, yeah, sometimes we sort of, those traits are sort of taken for granted because we know they're always there. Whereas when someone's a bit more harsher with you, with the boundary, then you're a bit more careful not to lose that, that connection with them. But you remember, we, brought, we were brought up in different eras. So I was brought up in an era where women, not many women worked. Yeah. So, whereas your mom always worked. So there's a different, and there has, there has been a shift. So I've always worked. Mm. So my kids are used to me working. Aid, you've always worked. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, so. my mum, yeah, always works. This brings me back to something you mentioned earlier, Michaela, that do we want, do women want a seat on the C-suite? Do they want a seat at the table? Oh, they want a seat. Right. Do they think it enough. is worth their time? Okay. That's okay. my big question. Do, do they think, think it is worth it for the effort? Yeah. For the struggle? Not sure. Not sure it's worth it. Or do they think they're good enough? Oh, I'm sure they know they're good enough. We know we're good enough <laughs> to sit at any C-suite, 100%, 100%, 100%. But the struggle is real and we, ne we need to accept it. It's, it's very tough. And, and, you know, there's a lot on us because we don't maybe push ourselves forward or we don't, you know, communicate as much as we should possibly yeah. or we give up very easily. But it wears you down. So the, 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 the climb wears you down. And how would you encourage listeners, encourage women watching the, the show, how would you encourage them to, to think about that, to make that evaluation to whether they do want that seat at the table? So my, my, my take is that when you reach a certain age, at least this is for, for me, but I've spoken to a number of women at my age, 
your definition of success changes. So when I was younger, I was ambitious. I wanted a seat at the C-suite. It would have been great, a great validation for me to have a C-suite. Today, my, my definition of success has shifted completely. Yeah. So at some stage, I think in my 40s, 43, 44, it completely shifted. Yeah. And possibly it's because I recognize that, oh, my time's possibly up now. I need to focus on, on my girls and really give them. And I mention my girls because my son will have it easier. He's you know, in society. But, you know, modeling. And Yaz has taught me one thing. It's about modeling. It's how do you model yourself for your children? Um, so that's, I think that's, that's what shifted. We don't always agree, as you see. No, just what I see in Michaela is a real drive and passion for work, yeah. right? So I think it's not that she doesn't want to be on the C-suite. It's just the environment was not created to get the best out of her at that level. And I put that on the responsibility of the leader to create an environment. And, and this is what pains me. This is what kills me that companies are losing people like Michaela, yeah. who have so much to add. I, I met a woman last week at Sanya. She told me I took early retirement. She works in financial services. She told me I was reporting directly to the CEO. I took early retirement because I was just done feeling unappreciated and feeling like I always have to fight every day. She had energy. She has wisdom. She has experience. By the time she retired, she was so fed up, the CEO called her into, the, into his office and said, what can I do to fix it? And how can I? And she just yeah. said, you know, I'm done. So too late. It was too late. too late. It was too little. Too, and this is what kills me. We are losing great people. And Michaela is, is an exact example of that. Any company would be lucky to have her experience, right, across so many different sectors at sea level. Mm -hmm. We have 10% participation rate. We have, I would imagine, quite a low percentage of non-executive directors. I was um, looking at the LinkedIn profile of a fantastic woman, in her LinkedIn profile, she had looking for non-executive board positions. I thought to myself, this woman shouldn't have to look. They should be knocking down her doors <laughs> yeah. saying, so right. come and be on my board. I want that wisdom. I want that experience. And, yeah. and this is where we're like the business community. We can do better. Yeah. We really can do better. And we, we don't need the data to show us that we can do better. The stories are all around us. But it's like, how do we create the right environment? And how do we get, makes me wonder, how do we get, or how do we prevent getting to that point? And, and I definitely reached it when I was in banking myself, the very particular example. How do we prevent getting to that point where we're just like, I am done, I am out of here. For me, it's a quick story, I saw at that time, and we are going back to kind of, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, so it was a different a different kind of environment and certainly much more focus on the, you know, the masculine traits. But I saw, or the women that I saw at those leadership positions in banking, I looked at that and I thought, I don't want to be that. <laughs> How sad is that? Can I make a, a quick deviation, kind of connected, um, but even me myself, the way I've used and, and, and labeled qualities as masculine, I think actually it's wrong, right? you know, because this is again, going back to our stories, strength is masculine. Mm -hmm. If you look back at the stories and the ancient myths of Artemis and Medusa and, and so many, yes, I'm going back, right? <laughs> go, uh -oh. go back. <laughs> a couple of years. <laughs> strength is not a masculine quality. Those women around the table have given birth should know better than I, right? Strength is not, but sometimes we put on these labels, right? And I think sometimes we have to like also catch ourselves yeah. with these subconscious biases. I take your point, but I don't think it's the strength which was exhausting. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was being masculine which was exhausting. I think what's exhausting is not being seen yeah. for the person that you are and the contribution that you're giving. It's turning up every day. And instead of being able to give your best and getting the fulfillment out of that, you're giving your best and it's just being ignored or it's constantly beating your head against the same wall. That's what gives burnout. It's not yeah. the strength. I love strong women. I think it's a really great quality. And I think there's nothing to shy away from it. And I, I don't think that's actually what burns us out. I think you're right. I think for me, and you know, I have my own story of burnout as well. I, I think that's me turning up, believing I, I had to be something other than I am really inside. I was out of alignment. And, you know, ultimately that took a huge toll on me. So... It's a, but yeah, my it's argument a would be, point. you're still strong now, right? Your leadership, yeah. you're creating this new project. You have so many different things going on, right? 
but it's just you're inspired and that strength is actually bearing fruit. So then you get re-energized. Yes. Yeah. So, and do you think that's, is that common? Is that something that contributes to holding women back that, that we aren't recognized, we aren't appreciated, we don't mm. get the, the appreciation in the way that we would like it. So not only financially, but in terms of, hey, you're doing a great job. Is that, that, what, is that lacking? I, th I think it is. I think, uh, and actually interesting, I think sometimes women respond more positively to that type of, if we look at reward and recognition, you know, they'll respond more to something like that or getting the promotion than they will necessarily to the financial, yeah. you know, I I uh, gain. Um, as, as well. And certainly even if you look at it statistically, I think if you look at things like employee data, you split up the data by male and female, it's interesting that the female one generally will, will show as being less satisfied with recognition, you know, that simple thank you, than males will be. Because I think it's expectations. Male, maybe they don't look for it as much, they don't need it as much, or, you know, they're, they're, they appreciate recognition maybe through financial reward. It's, it's, it's different. Uh, but certainly women feel less recognized um, and appreciated in, in, in the workplace. I mean, typically, if we're to look at it uh, um, f from a data point of view. And so. that would definitely contribute to that point that you get to, as you said, Michaela, you're like, I am done here. Are you going to turn up every day and do your best, give your all, sacrifice other parts of your life if somebody isn't, you know, giving you that pat on the back and saying, actually, we really appreciate you? Mm. I think there's, I, I've only ever written one poem in my life. Mm. Only one. <laughs> it's called Unseen. Oh. Only one. And every time I read it, I become very emotional. And the reason is, is, is this is you do feel unseen. You do. And sometimes I, I, you, you look at life and you say, how, 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 have I, you know, how has it passed? Because you're juggling everything constantly. And I think one of the reasons that women want more validation or at least a thank you and well done tap on your back is because the effort is bigger. It's, it's bigger. We work harder to get there somehow. You know, if I'm, if I'm thinking about something, I'm writing something. So any article I write, I'll write it five times. I'll think about it 20 times, you know. <laughs> if I'm going to give a speech, you know, simply moderating a conference. You know, we worked really hard. You don't just stand up on stage and wing it. You just don't. You discuss, you think, you work it, you rework it, you rework it. Then you speak from the heart. But you do it because you've, you've put in the work, you've yeah. put in the hours. Nothing is just winging it. And so that's why we somehow possibly expect people to notice that extra effort. And it's, it's, it's not seen. And so Yaz is perfectly right in the sense, how are we going to make women feel seen yeah. around the table? How, how are we going to lead? And again, I don't necessarily blame the leaders. They are leaders of their time. Yeah. So how are we going to create an awareness with leaders, women and men, because, you know, Yaz is a CEO and now she's also coming into, into that space. And, and as we speak and as we discuss, she's realizing certain things. We all realize things. How are we going to give everyone space around the table? Not just the most vocal ones, not just the ones that we feel are the biggest allies to us. And this it doesn't just count for women, it also counts for men. Yeah. What you mentioned earlier, do we have to take a responsibility for that? Do we need to get better at asking for what we need do we need to say this if you want the best out of me this is what really helps totally totally i mean yeah. the other day i asked I, I told the kids i am so tired of you know mother's day and birthdays and nobody makes anything special for me so my, my third daughter she's usually very good at this stuff she put photos all over the room women you know in a sense is it something that we do that makes people not notice us? So we, we, can't, we, we don't step up. Yeah. And I felt really silly actually saying it. Listen, you know, hey, I, I need something specially done because that's what I do for you. I really go out of my way to make the day special for you. So I kind of expect you to do it for me. So is it, is it wrong to have that expectation? Mm. Or, should, or do you need to actually say it? And the truth is, we need to say it. Yeah. Men will walk into a into the managing director's office and say, I deserve a pay rise. Most women don't. 
They're not afraid to ask for it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? They'll say the worst thing that can happen is they can say no. Exactly. You know, that's the attitude. <laughs> <laughs> I so, think with women we'd be a bit more cautious of that. But are we, are we afraid of that no? Do you think if we didn't have... You can ask for what you want, and if you're happy with the no, then, then why wouldn't you ask anyway? Are we afraid of that no? Does that put us off? I think part of it is the, the, I mean, nobody wants to be rejected, nobody wants to be told no, but I, I, think, I think men seem maybe better able to, to deal with it. Um, you know, it's whatever, it's forgotten about in two seconds. Could but it also be that we expect people to notice us? I think it's, so it's there's the a bit of an expectation. Because we yeah. do it, as you said. Exactly. Because we do it, we, we do think it. somebody yeah. else should be able to do it, but it's... But it's un, un, unspoken. It's the unspoken word. It's, it's there. We have it inside us. But why are we so afraid to actually put it out on the table? You know, that, uh, uh, I mean, f f what holds us back from doing that? And I, and I see, and a lot of it, I think, you know, when, when I listen to these debates and scenarios and, and what I, why wasn't I promoted? Why didn't I get the salary? Why is my salary less than some? I'm like, but did you ask? You know, do, do you, you know, have you asked so that you understand so that the next time, I mean, the C-suite, uh, an example recently, I don't know, I was looking at a position, really wanted to be promoted into it, wasn't, you know, but I could sit there and I could let it broom, whatever else, but instead I had to say, why, you know, why wasn't I ready for that position? Now, what is it that I need to do next time that position, next time that opportunity comes around, what do I need to do or what, you know, gap do I need to close to be ready for that position? So I, I think a lot of it is like this internal versus external lotus of control. So what's in my control to change yeah. this situation? Yeah. I'm not happy with this, but, you know, next time it comes around, what am I going to do differently? So I get a different result. And I think a lot but of But also we have to, we have mm. to realise that our bosses do not wake up every morning and every evening thinking about Michaela. Yeah. That's the <laughs> truth. Yeah. You know, it's when, I, when I do HR, I say, you know, listen, you know, people are very busy. They have 200 emails in their inbox and they're not thinking about you. So you sometimes, you know, most times you but need sorry, to remind that them. That is the leadership model that's that has to change. Yes. Mm. Right? Because again, when you say like, is it us or we the problem or whatever, I don't even think we should frame it as we, right? Because the feminist agenda, let's say here in this context of business, is good for us right? Like both sides, men and women. The question is like, why aren't we putting enough attention to it? Because I, when, you're, when you talk and I agree with you, mm. right? In theory, I agree with you. When I think of the amount of energy for every woman on this planet to have to sum up the courage to walk <laughs> into, the man's of, into the boss's office, here, in the man's office, into the boss's office, battle those nerves, sweating and bracing herself for the rejection. And then she gets the no and then she has to go home. And when I think of the sheer amount of energy that that's going to take to get us to equality, I feel like, Pfft. yeah. However, if I think one company, one leader, one CEO, who's going to say, I'm going to listen to those people who are not speaking and I'm going to find my leaders, right, on the stage at the conference was, are leaders born or are they made? They're not, they're found. Leaders are found. And it's our job. And this is why my, I feel like I'm getting a bit obsessed with this rung, right? But we need to, as leaders, man or woman, if you want a good leadership team and if you want a good pipeline of leaders, you need to go down and find the leaders. That's one person at the top needs to change. A whole company is suddenly going to have a whole load of opportunities. Yeah. And I'm not saying, right, that if you're a woman that you're struggling with your worth and ask, that you shouldn't get coaching and work on that it's because it's going to make your life better, right? If you have that coaching and you have that support system, friends, right, we need to support each other. Adrienne told Michaela, you need to charge more, like, let's do it, right? But I think the, the pace of change that is needed, if we go incrementally, it's going to be 100 years till yeah. the, the gender pay gap at current rate of change is going to equalize let alone the participation rate in leadership level. So for me, the, the part of least resistance and the way I think this is most scalable is leaders. Let's go and find those leaders that are not the norm, that don't look like us, that don't sound like us, and they're going to challenge us, and maybe our meeting is going to take a little bit longer. But also, I, th I, think, I think the younger, to be fair, the younger generation will force this change. Mm. So the younger generation will force this change because they will not join companies which have this sort of culture. And so my message to leaders are, and to HR leaders and to C-suite members is check your vacancy announcements. See how many people are applying. Ooh. See how many people are applying. Mm -hmm. 
every single day to your organization? Are you struggling with recruitment? Are you struggling with retention? Those are the numbers you need to first look at. And if the answer is yes, if it's difficult to recruit, you know, we have a habit. You hear it so often. Ah, the gaming companies have ruined the market. Ah, you know, the young, younger generation don't want to work. That's not true. It's not true. It's really, really not true. Look inside. Put up a mirror to your practices, to your culture. Mm. Am I ready for the next generation? Is my business going to last another 10 years? Yeah. Am I going to recruit the best? And I, this is what they're going to be looking at. Can I drop a, a bomb in here, a statistic bomb from that McKinsey report? 50% of people want, when they're looking to join a company, 50% want to um, um, work for a company that is run by women. Hmm. Guess what the percentage of those that are men? 48%. 48% of men and 50% wow. of women want to work for a company which is women run. And I think that's a really beautiful statistic there in terms of you know leadership traits that we're looking for now that makes an organization successful and the type of leader we need to lead a successful organization is is, is shifting you know to rapidly something quite different to what it was previously yeah but the truth is if any leader looks down the ranks there are many 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 informal leaders many mm. it's finding them it's finding them and you're right, yeah, as you find leaders, and there are many leaders across any HR consult, any HR manager, any HR senior leader is able to pinpoint them very quickly. If they know their staff, they know exactly who the leaders are. These are the leaders you would ask to organize a party. You'd go straight. These are the people that you go to when you have a crisis because they're the ones that will rally the troops. Those are your leaders. And there you find, there you find many women there. And is that how, or is that one of the steps for how we start to mend those rungs, mend that ladder and bring people up with us? No, I think the first is to really have a bit of an honest conversation with ourselves and understand, you know, our environment first and say, okay, what can I do? Yeah. So the first thing Yaz said is, what can I do? What more can I do? You, you, you know, until today... You, you, you weren't talking as strongly as today. No, my, my awareness was much lower. And I, honestly, I, I don't feel good saying it, but I just wasn't paying enough attention to this until it was brought to my attention, which is why we're having this conversation, exactly. right? Because exactly. no leader sets out to discriminate and no leader no, sets out to have... intentional. Yeah. It's not intentional, but we just don't put attention. Perhaps it's easier for me as a woman to say, I didn't put attention to it. Maybe a man, it would be harder for them to admit it and say, I didn't do this. But this is why we need to create the safety for all of us to get on board with this. Because this is good for everyone. This is good for women. It's good for men. All men have a lot of women in their lives, whether it's, uh, they've definitely all got a mother. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, many of them have partners, children. And we've also moved, and I think this is very helpful for this, is that we've moved from the possibility of a one income household to now most families depending on two incomes. So if you are a man who's in a relationship with a woman, do you want your wife to be bringing home 10% less just because she's a woman? Because quite frankly, the house you're going to be able to buy, the holidays you're going to be able to go on, it's not just your salary anymore. It's both. No, no, no new families can buy property on one income anymore. I, I noticed that shift in, particularly coming from Ireland to Malta, um, and I, I would say that Malta probably, I, there was a felt sense of being almost slightly behind where we were in, in Ireland on, on, on this agenda, but part of it, it's cultural. You know, and again, I talked to my partner, I said, what is it in Malta that, you know, and it goes back to that, you know, the women being seen as the primary caregivers at home and, you know, trying to shift that kind of perception um, and, and expectation. But he said, listen, he said, you know, he said, my parents, they didn't, my, my mother didn't need to work. He said, most yeah. women don't need to work because, or didn't need to, because Malta was a place where, you know, you could survive quite comfortably on a one income. So there wasn't the pressure of property prices and the pressures of property, you know, of, of cost of living, etc. Now there is that pressure there. And now, I mean, the reality is that you need uh, like almost like a dual career family dynamic in order to be able to have a comfortable, you know, lifestyle in, in Malta and to live well in, in Malta. So I think if we went back maybe 20 years ago, I don't think we would have had to have a dual career situation, but now we do. And, and Therefore, you know, we're seeing that shift. But, you know, again, it's like a, 
It's like the, 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 young, the young lady, you know, in Malta. I am Malta like a young lady. We still have quite a bit of growing to do. Mm -hmm. And we're still maybe playing on catch up maybe. or We're still evolving. Um, so, but I think, you know, by having conversations like this, by talking yeah. about it, that obviously then it helps to, to that, that journey, you know, that we become much more educated in terms of how we approach. Because like a young lady, we're going to make mistakes along the way, but... And um, the more we can learn from each other, the more we help. And I each say other. we're hitting puberty for the simple reason. No, <laughs> I'm seriously. Well, I mean, I'm hitting menopause, not puberty. But but uh, um, pu in terms of the cultural element is very very strong. strong so especially yeah. when you when you're working and raising children, and I know you have a full podcast on this, so I'm not going to go into that zone, not too much at least. Um, but when you're raising kids and you're also working, there is a very large element of FOMO. So a fear of missing out, yeah. a fear of your children missing out because mm. you're missing all those school outings. Mm. You know, you don't have enough leave days to cope with parents' days, with um, uh, development days, with summer holidays, with Easter holidays, with Christmas holidays. You don't, they just don't exist. So you're constantly being, you know, tugged at, at all ends. And then besides that, you have sicknesses and you have the social element because, mm. you know, as the kids, especially from the ages of like five to, to 12, 13, your children's social life is, you know, play dates and this and that. And you can't do that. Right. You know, and and uh, school concerts and helping at school and school outings, you miss out on all this. So uh, in the past, mothers didn't miss out on this. Yeah. Because they didn't work. Mm. So all of a sudden, you're, you're, you know, that, that tug. Yeah. Or they had a job, you know, so you had a, you know, mother didn't work whatever the father does. Then you move into kind of a, a phase where the woman has a job and then the, 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 the man has the career. And now we're starting to enter into a phase of two careers. And, you know, again, if I reflect on, and I've worked in, I don't know, a number of different countries, probably about six or seven. When I moved to Malta, it was a real culture shock for me that we were still almost in, in that kind of era of job and career, you know, dynamic in, in a family. Now, if I look now, I feel very much so that we're moving into that era of career, career, you know, and trying to manage a dynamic in a household where two people are, are they've got the career, but they're also trying to raise a family. So mm -hmm. it's like we're, we're just a bit behind, but evolving. Uh, yeah. yeah. I have to one of the biggest surprises when I moved to Malta and it really, really struck home with me, you know, about the culture. Um, it was, I, I think I started around January time. And it was the first of July, it was the first Friday in July. And I don't know, it's around one o'clock or something. Next, everything, everybody's jumping up and they're grabbing their bags and whatever and out the door. And I'm looking around going, why is everybody leaving? I'm thinking it's a fire or whatever, a drill or something. <laughs> <one> <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody's leaving. I'm thinking, well, you know, follow the group or whatever. I said, well, why is everybody leaving? And, and this little girl looked at me, she said, Adrian, she said, it's like Friday. It's like we have a half day on Friday, family day. And I'm looking at her going, what? She leave at half day on Friday to have a, fa a family beach day is what they called it. I thought this was hilarious. But obviously <laughs> now I've become acclimatized to the culture. And this is completely normal because family is so yeah. important. Yeah. I'm here. I'm sitting back going, this is amazing. I'm telling my friends in Ireland, I'm picking up the phone, you're not going to believe it. I had a first family day today. <laughs> you know, but that is, you know, the, the kind of the, the difference, you know, and that, that's, you know, the impact of... And, and the lifestyle and the culture in Malta, you know, yeah. and it's so, so important, that family dynamic and the backbone, the spine of that family is, is, is the woman, yeah. um, you know, and, and seen as the, it's, it's the backbone, it's the, mm -hmm. you know, you look after the kids, you're probably, there's, there's maybe parents, grandparents, you know, there's the, the food. Now, and now you're asking me that I have to have the dual career role as well on top of it. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's shifted us down quite a, a bit. Whole new rabbit hole of exactly <laughs> of the impact of that on the pay pay gap and, and etc but just kind of wrapping up the conversation what would you like the listeners uh, what can you leave them with in terms of what would you like them to think about how can they tackle this in their own lives either themselves personally or in their environments or if they are owners of, of businesses what what can they do what would your advice be Adrian? Uh, I, I think if I was looking at it as an organization, I, I would be looking at it probably in terms of, you know, that, that kind of broken rung or, or yeah. really looking at the, the data behind it. But 
okay, we, we understand where it is, but it's only until I actually get out and talk to people and listen to their stories um, it, that I will really understand what it is, you know, or what the dynamic is or why, why that's happening. Um, so I think that at an organization level, but at a personal level, you know, I've never um, encountered in, in my nine years in Malta any sense of being, you know, maybe held back because I'm a woman. Um, and, you know, it's, it's like I don't see the barriers. Maybe that's part of it, maybe they're there, but I don't see them. And I think a lot of it comes from, you know, ourselves and it comes from within. And, and you know, until we, we kind of believe in ourselves. And I think also, you know, if it doesn't feel right, you know, challenge it or, or discuss it. I'm wondering if you have like your you have x-ray specs or special powers superpowers in those specs to not see it is you know it, it's that a strategy even in and of itself to just be like I'm just not gonna I I, I don't I, I have to operate in that mentality yeah, yeah because if I got bogged down in the other mentality yeah I, I wouldn't make it yeah so I have to believe that it isn't there in order to get there if that Ooh, makes sense I love that <laughs> Michaela how about you I think it's to, to trust the process, not to put so much pressure on ourselves. So, so this worry. is key, to really not put, you know, very often, I, I, many people ask me the question, how do you cope? And I say, I don't. <laughs> and they're shocked by my answer. But the truth is, I don't cope. <laughs> I don't cope. I never have coped. You get through the day, you know. You get through the day. Would it be easier if we were, you know, given the space, given the environment? Yes. So basically it's not to put too much pressure. You yeah. miss that part, you miss that parents' day, you miss that play. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. You know, no, your kids are not going to remember it. Yeah. That's, that's, what, that's what I say. Yeah. They do remember when you left them at ballet and you didn't pick them up. That they remember. I've got, yeah. And they remember. <laughs> and they remind traumas. you a million times over, but you know, and you're human too. Mm. So there's so much you can do. Yeah. And when you get to the end of the day and you, you know, you, you lie on your sofa and say, oh, I'm going to catch up with, you know, MasterChef and fall asleep after five seconds on the sofa. You know, you're completely worn out and you're mentally and physically tired. Yeah. So the idea is really less pressure on ourselves, a huge belief in ourselves to actually push us higher. And that's advice I also give to myself, but also to find people that you can work with and chat to. So I'm lucky to have Adrienne. I'm lucky to have Yaz. I'm lucky to have many women in my life that I can meet Inspiring. and I do meet. I call them my tribe that support me, that yeah. believe in me, and, and some men too that really believe in me. I mean, my husband, for one, for example, I wouldn't have been able to do it if he didn't believe in me and be my greatest fan. So it's to surround yourself by people that believe in you, that are going to lift you up rather than pull you down yeah. and, and share your madness rather than... And show that kindness that we show to so many other people in our, in our lives, show that to ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I think I do need to start saying why the discrimination is there. Um, and I mean, I experienced it myself. I remember this story very early on in my journey as an entrepreneur. I had this great idea to revolutionize the hospital food. And I thought I was just starting my catering business. I wanted to bring healthy food to the hospital. And I made an appointment with the minister. I can't remember if it was the economy or, or which exact, um, whether it was health. But then anyway, I went to, went to meet him. And obviously being quite inclusive, I took my head chef, who was a man with me, to the meeting. <laughs> and we, we, we walked in, we sat down with this minister, and I started explaining my idea. And this minister would only look at the man. So I was the entrepreneur, it was my business, my idea, I was the driving force, and he would only look and communicate at the man. And this is wrong, right? And, and there are these instances, and I feel for those women that have to deal with them a lot more than I do. Mm. Um, so I, I do want to say that it's there. Yeah. But at the same time, if we focus too much on the pain of those experiences, we're not going to bring everyone on board into our mission. So I think the solution is both men and women. And I, I don't meet many men like that, right? I, I meet a lot of men who want women around the table they just don't know how to do it and they yeah. don't even notice when they are actually being outright discriminatory they, yeah. they would be shocked if mm. you reflected that back to them yeah. probably if i went to this minister and said that he'd be shocked right so i think we need to bring them on board yeah. um and women as well right i mean i i'm very cognizant of the fact that and i was telling this to michael and adrian before we started that probably i wouldn't be in the position that I am now, if I wasn't my father's daughter. Right. If he was recruiting another CEO, would he have picked a woman? Right. 
I would say probably not. And not because he doesn't believe a woman could do it, but because of the broken rung, yeah. right? Probably his choice. And mm. this is something I hear from men a lot. Why should I pick someone just because they're a woman? Because they don't want to pick someone just because she's a woman. They want to pick the best person for the job. Yeah. The problem is the best person for the job is not there, not because women are not capable, but because we've lost them along the way. Yeah. So for me, it's really like, okay, men and women, especially when we're in leadership positions, whether it's in government, whether it's in education, whether it's in business, whether it's a family, I think we can do better to make sure that we are including women at every level. And that sometimes does require you to do things different, right? We've, we've come a long way with flexibility at work. I mean, I have two managers in my organization who are mothers. One of them works reduced hours and they are brilliant. I mean, their contribution, their leadership, they are fantastic. Yeah. Without flexibility, they would not, they probably would have quit. So even this thing of when people work, how we let them work, do we trust women to not count every minute that they're working? I know many women who put the kids to sleep, open their laptop and keep working. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Many, many women yeah. who do that. Yeah. So I think as leaders, as leaders, we need to create the conditions. Yeah. And that's both men and women. Obviously, there are a lot more men leaders currently, 90%. <laughs> right? So we need to get them on board um, onto that mission of inclusivity. Yeah. Mm. I'm guessing those women that you have also feel appreciated and accommodated and you've created a safe space for them to be, to be able to have that flexibility. Wonderful. What a fabulous conversation. We went all over, didn't we, with that conversation? And if you've enjoyed this conversation today, please tune in for the rest of the forthcoming series. We have so many great topics. And if you really enjoyed it, share it with a friend because we want to change the world. This has been the She Word Women in Business. Thank you. Mm -hmm.